Let's chat a bit about the artful dance that is omniscient point of view. It's not just some plain old technique, it's actually loaded with layers. So, let me break it down for you. We've got these four players, cinematic, classical, contemporary, and curated. The 4C framework of omniscience. Catchy, right? Think of cinematic point of view as the chill cousin in the omniscient family. Also it goes by the alias third person objective. This style is like a silent camera just rolling film on the scene. It's just capturing everything that's happening outside without diving into the characters heads. Like hanging back at a party and people watching. This style can be super effective in creating suspense because it leaves you guessing what's taking inside characters heads. It can also whip up some raw, real vibe. Just laying out the facts without any personal bias from a character's viewpoint. Though, it sort of fell out of favor in fiction after World War II. Reason being, writing ain't a movie. What makes Pro special is how it immerses you. The words invite you into the thoughts, feelings, and personalities of the characters. Not many folks want to stick with something too sterile or lacking depth for too long. I mean, if it's all visuals, you could just pop some popcorn and watch a flick, right? Having said all that, it's not doom and gloom for our cinematic POV. Sure, I wouldn't pick it for any deep character exploration, but it's got a secret weapon for genres like horror and thriller. You could, for example, peek at a creepy scene that focuses on a villain's actions without giving away their identity or motives. Or get inside the shoes of a sociopath, seeing but not feeling. There's some real potency in this, especially in action-packed horror scenes. It's like when you pull back the camera, the reader gets this eerie sense of dread and revulsion because of the things that's being unsaid, letting our imaginations fill the gaps. There is another situation where cinematic POV could hit the right note, action adventure fiction. These tales all about the zoom zoom, you know, fast paced, heavy on the details, really focusing on the what and how, not so much the why. This is for writers who lean heavy on plot, not so much character. Oh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you might find some cool use for this in the world of experimental literary fiction. In this case, it's like giving your reader a challenge, a little bit of a brain puzzle. You provide the pieces, carefully picked and positioned, and the audience gets to put together the meaning of it all. I gotta admit though, this isn't my wheelhouse, so I can't give you the nitty gritty details on how to make it work or grab examples that click with me. In any case, here's my two cents. Treat cinematic POV like a secret spice. Use it sparingly, but with purpose. When you want to tease out just a bit of info, keep a lot under wraps, or amp up the suspense by keeping a lid on emotions, that's when you whip it out. Now, when you think about omniscient POV, chances are you're probably picturing what we call classical omniscience. You know, when there's this cool, all-knowing narrator. They're like this charismatic tour guide, spinning tales about all the ins and outs of the scene, and even spilling some juicy tidbits. Classical omniscient can be a blast. Imagine your narrator sharing witty remarks, inside jokes with the reader, or voicing their own opinions. It's got an old timey charm, tons of classic examples, but let's talk about how it plays out in some modern literature. Tear Moon Empire. This light novel nails it, with the narrator being the only one who fully gets the lead, Mia. Now, Mia's a piece of work. A self-centered, whiny, spoiled brat. She starts off in a rough timeline where she gets executed. Then she gets reincarnated as her 12-year-old self and, well, while she learned from her experiences, she's still herself. Most of the fun comes from her just trying not to kick the bucket in her second go-around. And all her good deeds are really just about self-preservation. Plus, add in all the hilarious misunderstandings due to everybody misunderstanding her. The narrator's quips throughout the whole ordeal are pure cold. I'll provide an early comedic example from the book for you to go through reading whenever you want. This style of narration is also super handy for weaving through all the timey-wimey stuff in the story. Classic Omniscience is the MVP when it comes to managing a big cast, fast settings, and dropping knowledge bombs. In Tear Moon Empire, 
It helps navigate all the characters Mia bumps into, the events from her past life she's trying to avoid, and everything in between. It's like having this bird eyes view of the whole shebang. The narrator can jump between timelines, other events, and still manage to keep things neat and centered. And that's why Classical Omniscience is the go-to POV for fantasy and historical tales. It can jive with sci-fi too, though I'll throw out a quick reminder that sci-fi and fantasy, while both under the same speculative fiction, are different beasts. In case there is any confusion with how this can explore what's going on in the heads of multiple characters, let's get one thing straight. The narrative voice is what keeps the omniscient POV from devolving into a head-hopping mess. Think of it like this. Omniscient POV is like a one-man band, while well, head-hopping is like a wild jam session where everybody's playing their own tune. Let's circle back to Tear Moon Empire to clear it up. Take this scene with Mia and Marco, a merchant she's setting up a deal with. The narrator is focusing predominantly on Marco's thoughts, but you do get insight into Mia's mindset as well. What organizes it all is the fact that it's delivered through the lens of that omniscient character, using the omniscient persona's voice. To contrast that with head hopping, here's a little scene I whipped up. You're getting a peek into both characters' thoughts and internal dialogue, but there's no smooth transition. It can make things confusing and pretty hard to follow. Normally, I'm all for pushing the envelope and playing around with techniques, but head hopping is one of the rare exceptions where I'll say, eh, maybe not. Getting back on track to the bright side, Classical Omniscient is your best bet if you're drawn to more vibrant, expressive prose. There's just so much more you can do with it. You can dive deeper into the description of the setting or the characters that any single character could ever give you. Plus, it's a total winner for setting the mood at the start and end of scenes. It's like your own personal mood lighting for your story. Now, while I've been singing the praises of the Classical Omniscient, Every style has its drawbacks, like, for one, the narrator might sideline your protagonist and steal the spotlight, despite the story not being about them, and instead of diving into the minds of the characters, we're sort of getting the news report version of their inner world, which can harm investment. Also, things can get real dicey if you don't play your cards right with information management. It can become a guessing game on who knows what, especially if you're dealing with crime fiction where every detail counts. And another heads up, it's super easy to tumble into a purple prose with omniscient POV. Unlike more intimate POVs that need to focus on what's crucial to the character in that moment, omniscient POV has a free pass to go anywhere it pleases. But in the art world, freedom isn't always a blessing. It's easy to lose sight of the important bits, or even use the wide lens of omniscient as a cop out for plot issues, reducing characters to mere puppets on strings. Plus. Since your narrator is basically a guide, it's all too easy to end up in info dumping territory, rather than immersing your reader in the story. That's part of why it's kind of fallen off the radar a bit, despite still being a perfectly legit option. In fact, I imagine a lot in the web novel space who want to mimic manga and the like might be happy to hear all I'm saying. This is part of how light novels capture the same vibe, as I've best illustrated using Tear Moon Empire, a light novel with a manga adaption that is now becoming an anime. Now that we got those two out of the way, we can finally chat about contemporary omniscient. It's got the same reins on the narrative as classical, but it's kicked a persona to the curb. If you're after an analogy, think of classical omniscient as a Morgan Freeman voiceover, and contemporary omniscient as that Star Wars text scroll. It lays out all the information no single character could have, but without adding any character of its own. I like to think of contemporary as the middle child between cinematic and classical. It's got a bit of both their magic and their mischief. Contemporary often comes into its own at the start and end of scenes, or when switching from one scene to another. It can set the stage, zooming in to give a closer look at a character, then pull back when it's time to change scenes. I've touched on this in my video about narrative distance, so give that a look if you're interested. As for curated omniscience. This is the name I came up with for what is also known as limited omniscience or selective omniscience. Think of it as a hybrid between contemporary and limited third person POV. Basically, they use the writing techniques that come from omniscience, but keep the focus on a single character or two throughout the whole thing. I really don't have much commentary on this one though. It's more focused, but 
otherwise just something you can do to rein in the power of omniscience a bit. Personally, I'd recommend just doing third person limited instead when not sliding between narrative distances, but that's just me. No matter what, keep this in mind. Omniscient might not be the star of the show these days, but it's still a solid choice for storytelling. If you're feeling it, go for it. Just remember to choose it because it's the best tool for your story, not just because you're defaulting to it. Ask yourself if it adds something special to your story that other POVs can't add. Like how Tear Moon Empire's commentary adds to the comedy and helps the reader keep track of the massive narrative that includes all sorts of politics, economics, and personal dramas. Or, in The Legend of Eli Mon Press, how it helps to do things like show the spirit of all the inanimate objects that wouldn't have a voice otherwise. At the end of the day, it's a creative choice. You gotta weigh the pros and cons. If you want a bit more help with when to pull back the camera, check out my video on when to tell instead of show. And hey, if you want to say in what video I make next, head over to the community section of this channel. I put up a poll almost every week.